Good afternoon. Thank you for being here with us in person in this room, or for those of you who are watching out there, thank you for watching. Um, it's my pleasure just to welcome everyone here this afternoon to the Chambliss Faculty Lecture. I would like to start by just, can we just have a round of applause for Dr. Chambliss for supporting this wonderful event? Thank you. These events give us an opportunity to get to hear a little bit more about um, some of the amazing research and creative activity that goes on on our campus. And I think that we can't have too many opportunities to do that, the more the better. So I'm going to introduce uh, Dean David Booker, who will tell you a little bit about today's speaker. Good evening, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure this evening to introduce our speaker, Dr. Laura Sherrod. Uh, I will try to get many of the words right in here, but we have a historian trying to do science, so I apologize in advance. Dr. Sherrod earned her PhD in geology with concentrations in geophysics and hydrogeology from Western Michigan University, KZU. Um, and then shortly thereafter came to Kutztown University, where she is currently a professor of physical sciences. Along with that, she's very well published in journals such as sedimentary geology, marine and petroleum geology, environmental and engineering geoscience, and her two recent publications are in environmental and engineering geophysics. So I think I got the majority of those right. She, along with that equally impressive, she has by my count, 12 undergraduate co-authors with her publications. So she involves students in all aspects of her research. I tried to count the number of students that she has worked with and who have presented at conferences and the like. I got lost somewhere in my arithmetic when I ran out of fingers and all of that stuff, but her pet committee and peers have said it's close on to five dozen students or more, which is quite impressive to me with her dedication to students and to that research. She also, many of, many of us know that uh, she had the opportunity to travel to the Southern Hemisphere uh, a few years back as a geophysicist, as an expert in geophysics um, for a Discovery Channel program where they were working on, or called Escobar's Hidden at Millions. And I will tell you that as you watch her on the screen, she's carrying more equipment around than many of my old army pals. Um, which is a feat in and of itself. And uh, I've just got to say that my family, my daughter was a, uh, a fangirl. Um, so it was really awesome and inspiring with that. So thank you for taking that one on amongst other things. She's also the past president of the Environmental and Engineering Geophysical Society, as well as having several other roles. I could probably go through her resume for a while longer but I think instead it's probably uh, much more appropriate for me to end here and introduce her and say, Dr. Sherrod, it's a pleasure to have you here this evening. Thank you. So I'm gonna start with a couple acknowledgements and those acknowledgements are going to show up again throughout this presentation because I couldn't do the stuff that I do here at KU without a lot of people's support and assistance and help. First, because this is the title slide, I wanna say thank you to whoever fixed my title. They asked me to send them a title in an abstract and I agonized over it and thought, what can I title this presentation? And I tried real hard but I'm very, very bad at making titles that are catchy. So I sent them what I had and then it magically turned into this, which I think is a great title. So thank you, whoever fixed that. That's fantastic. And, and the other thing down there at the bottom, you see that the logo for Geophysics Society of KU? Every single student who has been a part of that group, past, present, and looking forward to the future, has helped me make my geophysics research program what it is here at KU. I can't do the work that I do without a lot of people helping to do the field work. So thank you to all those students, and I'll give you more thank yous for them later on throughout this presentation. 
All right, so Geophysics Society, we had just, just recently a historian introducing a scientist. Now you've got a scientist talking a little bit about history, but not a lot because history is not my forte. My dad was a historian. He had his PhD in history from Michigan State. I didn't get that bug. I got the science bug. And so a lot of what I'm gonna present to you today is science as opposed to history, but I'll tie it into the history. And those of you out there who know more about the Revolutionary War than I do, at the end, you can add your two cents in to, to clarify anything that I might have not said quite properly up here. So geophysics is what I do. And geophysics is looking under the ground without having to dig things up. We use instruments at the surface of the ground that measure changes in the physical properties of the subsurface without having to dig down and see what they are. And we're able to make really great images of what might be in the subsurface based on physical property changes. This image that's on screen right now is a resistivity image. We injected electrical current into the ground and watched how the ground responded to that electrical current passing through to map out the location of a cave. This is a Pennsylvanian cave. And I'm gonna go through with you three different types of geophysics before I get into the part where we talk about the mass burial, the topic of, of this presentation, because it's important for you to have a little bit of background of what it is that we're looking at in order for what I show you at the end to make a little bit more sense to you. The three methods that I'm gonna tell you about are resistivity, magnetometry, and ground penetrating radar. Okay, so the first one, resistivity, that was what that image in the previous slide showed you a picture of how the resistivity varies with, with depth in the subsurface. With a resistivity survey, you take four metal stakes, we call them electrodes, and you put them in the ground in a line. Two of those metal stakes represented up there by the yellow arrows, the A and the B electrodes, two of them get an electrical current passed through them and they inject that current into the subsurface. The other two, the orange stakes up there, they measure the change in electrical potential caused by that current passing through. And what that gives us is a point of measurement here at the center of the survey that tells us how the electricity passes through the ground at that single point. If we take a lot of these data points, moving the electrodes along and also spacing them out wider so that we can get instead of a reading way up here, we get a reading way down here with depth, then what we can do is we can generate a cross section that shows what the subsurface looks like in terms of how electricity flows through it. This image is raw resistivity data. So each of these little black dots across the top, those represent a single electrode, a metal spike in the ground. We connect all those spikes to a cable that connects to a resistivity meter, which is basically a big switch box that switches between different configurations or arrays of these electrodes to give us all these different measurement points down here at the bottom. All of these resistivity data points come from different configurations of combining the current electrodes and the potential electrodes at the ground surface. Okay, a, a survey like this doing just a single line, you have to put 32 spikes into the ground and it have to be in a straight line and you have to connect them all to a cable and then you push a button for the resistivity meter to start taking data and it takes about 30 minutes. So it's, it's time intensive and it's also labor intensive. It's really great to have lots of students out there to help me do what I do because then we can take this type of image and turn it into something that looks like this that tells us something about what's happening in the subsurface with the electricity. And this is an example of a stream channel survey that I did up in the Schuylkill headwaters, where we did a stream channel resistivity survey to find out where the water that was in the stream channel was leaking out the bottom of the stream channel and entering into a mine down below. Water in the stream channel is nice and clean. Water that gets into the mine down below gets contaminated and then exits further downstream and becomes a contaminant at the surface, so that's a problem. I was invited up there to do some resistivity surveys to find out where water in this stream channel might possibly be seeping down into the mine pool. And by finding that seep, the area of low resistivity or the blue zone here, they were able to then grout the stream channel at that location and keep the clean water at the surface nice and clean and not allow it to go down into the mine and get contaminated. So it's cleaning up some, some pollution problems that they were having in the, in the Schuylkill headwaters. This is a single profile line. 
And to get the single profile line, we have down here, we have Dea operating the resistivity meter on the left-hand side. And over on the right, we've got David and Ashley laying out the cable for the electrodes. Down here at the bottom, you can see this red alligator clamp. It's connected to a metal spike, which is not very visible on the screen, but there's a metal spike here that goes into the ground. It connects to this cable clamp. They'll connect that to the cable. The cable will connect to the box. We'll have a line of 32 of those electrodes. Push a button, take some data, and get some results of what's in the subsurface. Dea was working at the Montezuma Wetland Complex in New York. We were trying to map out some brine springs in the subsurface. Um, the brine salt in the water is going to give it a much lower resistivity, so that will show up very well with the resistivity survey. And David and Ashley were doing a project where we were trying to map out buried bedrock in this glacial deposit valley over there, and that ties into the hydrogeology aspect of my research as well, because bedrock tends to have an impact on how groundwater flows. So that's resistivity surveying. And this is the type of image that we can create with that. This is a cave, the cave that I showed you back a few slides ago, right? And we can do the resistivity surveys in two dimensions where we just have a single profile view or we can put it into three dimensions so that we can see the whole shape of the cave or whatever system we're trying to map out in the subsurface. I've also done some surveys over mud volcanoes in Utah. And the mud volcano is this little blue spot right here. And if we strip back some of the layers, we can map out the exact shape of the mud volcano without having to do any digging at all, just by measuring how the electricity is flowing through the subsurface. We get really awesome images of what's going on down there. Next up is magnetometry. The magnetometer is this device right here. The big, huge staff is not the device. The device is that little cylinder up at the front. We have two magnetic sensors up here, and there's a data logger around this student's waist there. He's logging the data as he walks back and forth, kind of like you're mowing the lawn, to survey a big, wide area to see how the magnetic signature varies over that space. Magnetic surveys. They pick up the Earth's magnetic field, right? So you could measure of the Earth's magnetic field strength. But most of what I'm interested in has to do with near, near surface metallic objects. And by metallic, I mean ferrous metal, because that's the type of metal that's going to have a magnetic signature. And just to refresh your memory on magnets, right? This is a piece of paper over top of a bar magnet with iron filings sprinkled over top of it. You can see that the magnetic field lines, they have this nice shape, and we have a negative pole and a positive pole. By mapping out the magnetic signature in a wide area of land that has, say, a ferrous pipeline in the subsurface, you can do things like map out where there's a buried pipeline that might be leaking oil at an abandoned oil refinery. Right? So magnetometry can be incredibly useful for finding things of anthropogenic source, which is going to help us out later on in this presentation. The third and final geophysical method that I'm going to give you background on is my favorite. It's ground penetrating radar. GPR is fantastic. It shows you a profile of the subsurface. You can do it in three dimensions, and it's a lot faster to take the data than the resistivity method. So the concept behind ground penetrating radar is that you have two, two antennas. One is transmitting a signal. The other is going to receive the signal. The transmitter antenna will send a signal of electromagnetic energy down into the subsurface. And when that energy hits something that has a different electromagnetic content than what it's been traveling through, what happens is it'll bounce back up to the surface to the receiver. So on this slide, I've got my transmitter, I've got my electromagnetic pulse going down, this white box on the side, the white box on the side is what the receiver antenna is going to be receiving. When that pulse of energy is going down, the receiver antenna doesn't have much happening, not much going on there. But as soon as that pulse goes back up to the receiver, we get a pulse of energy representing this transition between layer A and layer B. And not all of that energy gets reflected back up to the receiver. Some of it refracts down further into the subsurface to give another little pulse between B and C, another one between C and D, another one down there at the bottom between D and whatever else is down below that. With this equipment, we can drag it along the ground, scooch it over and take another pulse of energy and pull it along, continually taking data. And we can get a profile of what's going on in the subsurface with with respect to the different stratigraphic layers or whatever else might be structurally interesting down in the subsurface. Okay, so ground penetrating radar. I'm gonna now take that little 
fabricated image, push it off to the right hand or left hand side, left hand side. And the right hand side now has some real GPR data. The difference being the stuff that I made over here on the, the left hand side that just has a single pulse that's showing you where the layers are. That single pulse would relate to the darker colored layers in the real GPR data set. This is from a sand dune that was right next to Lake Michigan. And in this sand dune, you can see where the water table is. And you can also see a old soil horizon, a paleosol. Okay. And you can also see some really cool structural features within the sand dune itself. GPR is really great at imaging the subsurface as long as the subsurface doesn't have a really high clay content because that wipes the signal out. But it's really, really good if you're in the right location and you have the right type of subsurface to be able to visualize these things. You can also take that two-dimensional image, and if you do enough profiles side by side, you can turn it into a three-dimensional image. This is the paleosol horizon being mapped out in three dimensions. And you can also use it for biology. We have here some groundhog burrows that were mapped out. Here's the entrance, the tunnel, the ramp, and the chamber of a groundhog burrow in two dimensions on the left, three dimensions on the right. And I've got it kind of repeated top and bottom to remind myself to tell you that different sizes of antennas give you different images of the subsurface. The top antenna is a 400 megahertz antenna. The bottom antenna is a 900 megahertz antenna. The higher the frequency, the less you can see deep, but you get better resolution of the shallow subsurface. The bigger the antenna, the lower the frequency, you can see a lot deeper, but you lose some of that resolution. So your choice of antenna size impacts the quality of the data that you collect. So groundhog burrows here and continuing along with the theme of biology, this survey is a map view of GPR data. So we took several profiles and we took a slice of that. The purpose of this survey had nothing to do with tree roots, but it's a fantastic image showing you that massive trees, the circles all represent trees. And just to show you how massive, here's Kaylin and Corey standing near that enormous tree. Those trees have root systems and the GPR can be used to image the root systems as well, right? You can see the root coming out from all of those black circle trees, okay? GPR is great. You can see all sorts of things with it. I have had my students dragging my equipment across numerous states, all over the place, up and down the sides of mountains. This is Ken and Jared and my friend Andy, who works at the New York State Museum, surveying with a 100 megahertz GPR antenna at New York State's largest landslide in state history. And here we have Adam and Sarah walking along with the GPR in Virginia down in the Chincoteague area, Wallops Island. And also my daughter made it into that picture as well. She was with us for that work. And here we have David and Kaylee and Ryan pulling the antenna in Utah where we had the mud volcano work. And here we have Kim with my geophysics class for that particular semester pulling the antenna up a hill. This is the cave survey, the resistivity cave that I showed you. Same, same area for this one, but with GPR instead. So to do the work that I do, I need these students to help me out. I can, I can lift a lot of equipment. I can carry a lot of things but it would take a really long time to get the work done if I were doing it on my own. I need these guys. So yes, I involve a lot of students in my work. They work hard. They work hard for me. And then we come back to the computer lab and we process the data. It's a little bit lower intensity, but we're out there in the field. We're pulling the equipment along. It's oftentimes hot and buggy, but it's a great experience for everyone. The best though is when we get assaulted by news media because GPR is really interesting and lots of people in the media want to show everybody about it. This usually happens when we're doing some sort of archeological or historical type project. This is the Burnside Plantation in Bethlehem where Austin is being chased by the camera that's trying to get the best angle of the equipment being pushed along. That's a 400 megahertz antenna down there. And this is Corey being followed by the camera in Douglasville at the Fritz Cemetery. Okay, so in order for me, a scientist, to do these projects that tie into archaeology and history, I need help. And these are the, the groups that have offered to let me come out to their location and find things for them. Find things with my equipment so they don't have to dig down or find things so that they can dig down in the right spot. 
the partnership that I have with local historical groups in the area started with this one right here, the Historical Society of the Phoenixville area. Um, a man named Adam Deveni contacted me through email and said, hey, you do GPR. I've got this big area of land where we think that it used to be a cemetery, but we're pretty sure the bodies got moved to a cemetery down the road at some point over the course of its history. Can you come survey and make sure? And I said, probably. So we made a, a class trip of it. This is the old historic picture of the location he wanted surveyed. And as you can see, there's all sorts of headstones in the area. And the reason they wanted it surveyed was because the building, which used to be a Lutheran church, was now the headquarters of the Historic Society of the Phoenixville area. So they wanted to know if they could put a parking lot over top of some of the ground. If there were people still in the subsurface, they didn't want to put a parking lot over them. But if there weren't, because this is what it looks like now, no headstones at all, why not put a parking lot there and have more parking for their members? So I took my group out there. This was a class project that we did for my geophysics. And we surveyed with the GPR. We walked the GPR up and down the survey lines and we collected a whole bunch of data. And now I'm gonna take you back to some more of this how to look at the data part portion. If I am trying to find a burial in the subsurface, a body buried in the subsurface, that's not marked at the surface, I'm trying to find a coffin in the ground, okay? Because of the nature of those electromagnetic waves that are going down through that first layer A, when they hit the corner of the coffin, what happens is they diffract. They give a diffraction hyperbola off the edge, okay? And that shows up in my profile over on the right-hand side as a nice little diffraction hyperbola. Because coffins have more than one side, I'll get another one on the other side. So I'll get this little umbrella shaped or hyperbolic reflection in my profile. And this is an example of the results that I got from Adam's site, where they thought that there were some historical records that seemed to indicate all the bodies had been moved to a cemetery down the road. No, they, they haven't all been moved to a cemetery down the road. So I told him, actually, you probably don't want to don't put a parking lot over there because there, there might still be some people down there. Now, one of the issues that, that geophysics has is if I hadn't gone through and told you exactly what I was looking for at this site and I showed you this image, it's a bunch of squiggly lines, right? And those squiggly lines could be bodies, or they could also be any other discrete object in the subsurface that could give us a diffraction hyperbola. In order to tie it into the real world and what it really means, I need to first know something about what I'm looking for at the site, which is why I need to partner with these historical groups to figure out what they want to find and see if I can help them. And then I also have to de design my survey so that I can get more than just, yeah, there's a hyperbolic reflection. I wanna get the hyperbolic reflections are showing up in multiple parallel lines and they're about six feet long. And also they're showing up so that I have them kind of parallel to each other as if they were laid down in rows of burials. Okay, so it's not just going out and collecting the data, it's designing the survey in a way that I can pretty much verify that, yeah, that is indeed most likely a body. And until I dig it up as a geophysicist, I would never say it is a body until it gets dug up because this is this is just a picture which could be some other source but I'm pretty sure it's bodies there so there's the unmarked burials this was a successful venture for us because we found something uh, not so successful for Adam because he couldn't do his parking lot but it was great experience for the students who were involved with that project the other thing that I often will get asked to do surveys for by historical groups is foundations Foundations are going to have a very similar signature to a coffin. So instead of a coffin, now this is a foundation stone and the edges of the foundation stones are gonna get little hyperbolic reflections as well. And the difference is gonna be, I'm not looking for six foot burials anymore. Now I'm looking for lines that are pretty rectangular in nature of those hyperbolic reflections. And what it ends up doing is taking the lines of data and slicing through the top of them and making a map that shows me things like the outline of this old cemetery wall very, very clearly in the GPR data. Okay, so burials, super easy to find. Foundations, super easy to find as long as I have enough students to come out with me and help me get that field work done. You can also use magnetometry to find foundations as well. This is a old fort over in Michigan where we have 
a rectangular shape to some of the anomalies. And some of the magnetic features here kind of line up in bits of rectangles. What's happening with the magnetometer is when rocks are formed, they have a magnetic signature kind of embedded in them from when they crystallize. And when they get moved to a new position, that magnetic signature gets shifted. And so we can have magnetic anomalies caused by that shift. And if they're rectangular, for me, that means, hey, that could be a foundation such as this one here. That was in this previous one. This was down here at the edge of this corner. We have a bunch of layered stones. There's even a burn profile in this one that the archaeologists who were excavating found. OK, so that's all the background information. Now on to the real topic here, which is finding a mass burial. The old Charlestown Cemetery in Chester County is where the, the surveys were performed. Okay, and it's a really nice cemetery, very nice, lots of trees, and there's this nice stone fence that goes around the perimeter. There are some headstones there and some headstones tilting and some monuments that are there. It's a typical Pennsylvania cemetery, except that it's believed that more than 200 soldiers of the Revolutionary War are buried somewhere within the walls in unmarked graves. The reason why this is such a popular place to bury Revolutionary War soldiers doesn't have much to do with the actual war, has more to do with the harsh conditions at the Valley Forge encampment in the winter of 77 to 78. The location of the Old Charlestown Cemetery is between Valley Forge and Yellow Springs Hospital. So when soldiers would get sick over here at Valley Forge, they'd be taken over here to the hospital if they got better, they'd go back to Valley Forge. If they didn't get better, there was a conveniently located cemetery on the way back to Valley Forge. So that is, the location is everything. That's why we have so many of these soldiers believed to be buried in that cemetery. Next, I'm gonna introduce you to Anne Klein. Anne is a fabulous woman. She's fantastic. She is the woman who invited me to bring my students down and see if we could find some unmarked burials. And the reason why she wanted to look for unmarked burials was because she was in possession through the Historical Society of the, of the um, Charlestown area of this hand-drawn map that had been found in the wall of the hospital. Okay, so this map had been stuffed in the wall and somebody later when the hospital was being like renovated or torn down, found this map. And in the center of the map, I don't know if you can read it out there, but if you squint your eyes, that says pit 50 bodies. So there is on this map an indication that there's a mass burial within the cemetery. The reason it was in the wall, I asked because I, I'm not a historian. I have no idea why you'd like hide something in the wall of the cemetery. I was told by the historical folks down there that during a time when you're at war, you want to keep morale up and you don't want to advertise the fact that you're having mass burials happen. So it got stuffed in the wall and found later on. So we have a pit with 50 bodies that we're trying to locate at this location. And we also have up at the top corner, that's the site of the original church built in 1743. It is no longer there, but maybe we can find some foundation stones that might show up as geophysical anomalies. Okay, so the difference between finding a single unmarked burial, a coffin, and finding a mass grave type burial is that we're not looking for a coffin anymore. Now we're looking for some sort of trench feature or pit feature that's big enough to hold, in this case, 50 soldiers. So that trench feature is going to show up as a trench feature in my GPR profile. It'll probably cut through some of the stratigraphic layers, so I won't see those going across there. And it may even have what's called a sag feature across the top. If you bury 50 soldiers, over time they decompose and you get some sagging of the top layer. So we're looking for a pit and a sag feature at that cemetery. When Anne first contacted me and was telling me it's a Revolutionary War cemetery and I'm thinking, okay, what year? That's the 1700s. Over time, bodies decompose and the decomposition of a body means that it's becoming more and more like the surrounding soil which makes it more and more difficult for my equipment to be able to detect it. So when we first started this, I said, I'll do this, but I really don't think we're gonna find anything. That's like 250 years ago. That's a really, really, really long time. 
for me to still be able to pick up a signature that will mean anything. But we went out, we did it. I took my geophysics class at the time and they looked around and surveyed where the headstones were and, and got the lines all in line to walk the GPR up and down. And the GPR that we used was the 400 megahertz antenna. So we're looking in the shallow subsurface because we don't need to see very deep down. If you're digging a, digging a mass burial, you don't go very deep shallow subsurface. And this lady right here, this is Heather Willever. She is the reason why this entire project had a happy and successful conclusion. Otherwise, it would have not quite made it. So she'll, she'll be thanked again and again throughout this presentation. We did the GPR survey. We did a magnetometer survey, same thing, walking the lines. And the results that I got with this class of geophysics students were very, very inconclusive. Um, we oftentimes will go out and collect data. And because students are not familiar with the procedures, this is a practice run for them. And because they're not as familiar with the equipment, sometimes every once in a while when I'm not watching, some of the lines will get messed up a little bit and the data will come back and it'll be like a little bit messed up. Maybe we can make sense of it. This data set, I couldn't make any sense of it at all. I took the GPR data and I took a slice of it and I see some zones of like big reflections, some lines of it, but I really can't tell much of anything from the GPR data. The magnetic data was a little bit more promising because we had a few zones that might've been something, but it was tough for me to see much of anything. And as a geophysicist, you get used to finding things where there's really almost nothing to find. So this was tough. I told the class, we got data. I can't see anything in it. Do any of you want to go back out and redo the survey and see if you can be a little bit more particular and take a little bit better care and maybe find something at the site? And Heather was right on that. She took that project and ran with it in the middle of winter. This was the coldest day of January 2018 when she and her group of friends came out and redid the MAG survey. They redid the GPR survey and they set up a really nice grid system using meters and she GPSed in the coordinates of the trees and the rows of gravestones that were there at the surface and the monuments or memorials that were there at the surface and the suspected areas where we might have a mass burial and where we might have the church foundation. She did a fantastic job and she was very, very particular about the whole thing. Um, this monument right here is the monument to a officer and that differs from the graves of regular soldiers because the magnetic signature at the officer's burial is very distinct, right? We've got these purples and reds that are showing up at the officer's burial because probably he was either buried in a coffin that had some sort of ferrous iron material in it, or he might have been buried with some of his weapons as well, versus the other rows of graves, you don't see much of anything. Um, so definitely we can detect officer burials, which are already marked, so it's not very useful. We can't really see much of anything going on down here at the suspected area for the mass burial with the magnetometer, but up at the top, you see how those magnetic signal, whoop, oh no, now I don't know what I've done. Try trusting that one. That's not the right one. I'm going to try using a mouse. Almost there. There we are. Back on track. All right. So officer burial, mass burial, and over here at the top, the foundation of the church. And as I said, as a geophysicist, you kind of have to squint your eyes and look and see. It's kind of rectangular. Yeah, those anomalies, those features. And if we compare this to what we would expect to find for a foundation for a church, the size is six meters by 10 meters, which converted to feet is 18 by 30-ish feet. Okay, so it's about the right size. And if we compare it to the site map that Anne gave to our group, the church is up here in the Northwest corner, which is kind of where that rectangular sequence of magnetic anomalies are. And the difference here though is the orientation, right? You're looking at this and you say, well, that's straight up and down. This is angled off to the side. But if you look at my north arrow down here, my north arrow is going off to the side also because the students lined up their, their survey line with the wall of the cemetery, which 
probably wasn't the same wall of the cemetery that they had way back when. The roads have shifted a little bit. So if you take my magnetic map and you shift it so that north is pointing north, it lines up pretty well with where we think that foundation ought to be. So yeah, maybe we found the foundation with the magnetic data, but we definitely didn't really find much of anything at this mass burial location. So let's take a look at the ground penetrating radar data. The GPR data that Heather collected was spectacular with one exception. It was the coldest day of January in 2018 and the battery died. Batteries don't last as long when it's so cold. So she made it from zero all the way to 23 meters over. She missed the last seven meters. So we said, well, that's okay. We still got coverage over the mass burial and maybe we'll get a little bit of something from what might be a foundation up here. We'll just take a look and see what we've got. We might need to go back out and resurvey, but surveying takes time. So we'll, we'll see if we can, can do without it. So I'm going to show you three profiles of GPR data. We're going to look at a slice of the earth at line number three, line number 13, and line number 18. Line number 13 is going to go kind of close to where we suspect the mass burial to be. And line number 18 will come up here and possibly cross over that zone where we had the anomaly from the foundation in the magnetic map. Okay. Line three is on top. That was the one on the leftmost side. 13 mass burial is in the middle. 18 foundation is at the bottom. And what I'm seeing as I look at this is, wow, that looks a lot like what I described a mass burial to be to you, right? At the beginning when I said you're looking for a trench-like feature. That's the wrong spot. It is the wrong spot. It's up in the Northwest instead of down in the South Central portion. Okay, so we'll, we'll hold on to that for just a minute. Where we expect the burial to be, there's this guy that shows up and that's kind of looks sort of like a trench, but it's really small, not nearly large enough to hold 50 bodies, okay? And then down at the bottom line 18, the foundation would be over here in the upper section. So we have some transition here of weirdness going on that could possibly be the foundation stones distorting the, the signal right there. So the profiles show us some things, but we need to look a little bit further to see exactly what they're telling us, because it looks like the mass burials up here in the Northwest. So let's take a look at, instead of profile lines, let's take a map view of these, the image. In the map view, taking a slice out of our GPR data, what I see is down here where I had that small little feature in line 13 on the previous slide, I've got a rectangular shape. Rectangular shapes in my geophysical data mean anthropogenic sources. So definitely there's something there. It's still too small to be a mass burial. Also on this image, we can see what appears to maybe be the outline of the church. It kind of matches up a little bit with the rectangular shape that we saw in the magnetic map. And another fun fact, you can also see some little individual burials, single burial anomalies in many locations along the roads of headstones. So we can see things with the GPR, but my mass burial site is really, really way smaller than I expected it to be. So this is the profile view, and that's the, the little trench that we saw. And now practicing your geophysical skills, squint at it, turn your head a little bit, and, and do you see that? See that right there? Can you see it even without the black line, right? If you look at it long enough, if you stare at these blue and red lines long enough, you can start to see lots of things. This is the extent of the actual pit that was dug out for the mass burial. It's not nearly as distinct as this one, but it's in there. It's in there. I can definitely see truncation and change of the bed layers here and here, and there's some slopes going in there. So it's there, but it's not jumping out at me. What jumps out at me is the sag feature at the top, which is part of what I was looking for, but it, it's much smaller. And it changes the size. Down here we have the size being pretty small with the sag feature, but if we add in the whole pit, we can see it's much larger. Large enough, in fact, Heather did the calculations to fit 50 people in there. So yeah, there's evidence of a mass burial at the location that we expected. We just had to look a little bit closer in our data set in order to make that interpretation come to light. The feature over here on the right-hand side that really looks like a mass burial, right? It's a huge trench-like feature with all sorts of little hyperbolic reflections inside of it, which indicate there are discrete objects, possibly bodies that are buried in there. That's in the very wrong location for the mass burial. It's along this 
section of the map right here, and it's big. It's 60 feet by 10 and a half feet, which is really, really big. Um, and if we compare that to the map of the location, it's right in line with the old wall. So the historians who know way more about the site than I do, and I said, there's something here. I can't quite tell what it is. It looks like a burial, but, but it's really big. They said, oh, it might have to do something with either the old wall that was put there, or they also thought there might be a midden pit, a trash pit, where the church would dump its trash. You want it far enough away from the church that it's not going to cause any problems, but close enough that you can get to it and it's easily accessible. So somewhere over here, we may have found the midden pit for the church with the geophysical methods. The geophysical method I started with was resistivity, so we're going to tie in with that before we wrap up. Resistivity is time consuming, labor intensive, and takes a really, really long time to get all that data. So instead of surveying the entire area, we did a survey just over the zone where we thought there might be the mass burial. We did a line every single meter, looks like this. So we have our line separated by meter, and we have electrodes separated by meter, and we collected data from each of those lines. And there's a, there's a really small but really good body of literature out there on what to expect when you're doing a geophysical survey looking for bodies. There's the forensic aspect of it, there's the mass burial war aspect of it, there's the regular old cemetery aspect of it. All of the research on doing resistivity to find burials states that you'll either get a high resistivity anomaly or a low resistivity anomaly or no anomaly at all which covers, whoa, covers all the bases. And I didn't even break it, woohoo. But I did stop my presentation. That's an easy fix, cool. So when we were going out there to do the resistivity survey, we weren't sure exactly what to expect. We were hoping that maybe by plotting the data over here that's way outside of the mass burial and the data within the mass burial and the data outside the mass burial, we'd see some sort of distinction between what was not mass burial and what was mass burial. And turns out that our zone of mass burial had a higher resistivity showing up. These dashed lines here are showing you the pit and the sag feature in the middle two lines. And this is off the side, this is off the side. It shows up as a anomalous response in the resistivity, which is exactly what we'd expect based on the literature, because we could have had anything. So tying it all together, doing this survey, we found a mass burial using ground penetrating radar and resistivity. The magnetometer wasn't particularly good at that. We found the old wall or midden pit over off to the side with both the, just the GPR. It didn't show up with the with the magnetometer, but if we'd done a resistivity survey over that, we probably would have seen a little bit of an anomalous feature there. It just takes a long time to do resistivity. And we probably found the foundation of the church, which was detected with GPR and magnetometry. Okay, so throughout, I've been saying students are helpful to me. This project spanned multiple iterations of students. In 2017, it was my geophysics class that went out in the fall. In 2018, it was Heather and her group of students that went out to take the data in the middle of winter. And then she presented at a national conference showing the results of the mass, mass burial section. And then in 2019, I got some additional calls from other people. Historians talk, they talk to each other, they network. I don't even have to. I just sit here at my office and I get emails saying, can you do this? Sure, happy to. In 2019, I got a couple of emails saying, can you come do a survey? I think we have a mass burial here. So I've done a couple additional mass burial surveys in the local area. And 2020, then it got pushed into publication. It takes time. It takes time. It takes lots of student work and lots of hours to get from the, maybe we can find something to, we found something really awesome and it's good enough to publish stage. 2017 to 2020. And throughout that time, I'm not just doing this project. I've got other projects that we're doing off to the side with other students. It's a fantastic way to keep students engaged and active and to give them practical experience that they're eventually gonna be using when they go out and get employed to do this type of thing for their job. More acknowledgements. I don't do this stuff alone. Anne Klein, she was fantastic. She actually even, she donated 
from the historical society a thousand dollars and from her own personal self another thousand dollars for the geophysics society of ku as part of this project so she is she's wonderful urc has provided funding for it we've got heather and her group and then the other group that i took back out for the resistivity survey lots of students have been involved in this work and at this point i'm at the end and we'll take any questions that anybody has But if you have questions, speak up. I wear hearing aids. I don't hear very well. So yell them loud. Yes. Um, this is really probably totally unrelated. But I'd be curious about your opinions on sinkholes. Is that one thing clear of us that collapsed? What about northern Siberia where the raw methane is involved? They have fires there. Uh, these are, are different. But is, is this? Are the sinkholes in a large part of the world? The sinkholes? sinkholes yeah. That I am not sure of. I do not know much about sinkholes. I did do some surveys of sinkholes in Varto with my students a few semesters ago, but I do not know enough to answer that question yeah. about sinkholes. Because there are certainly parts of the world where these seem to be, I mean, really. For sure. For sure. Right. Yeah. And, and uh, Siberia, for instance, there's a lot of methane going into the air, of course, as well as greenhouse gas. And yeah, stuff. yeah. Anywhere you've got limestone in the subsurface, you can definitely have sinkholes getting developed, such as Florida, such as Pennsylvania. Yes. Not often when it's burials of people. Um, sometimes when working with Dr. Newlander's group in, in the back over there, he's, he's invited my kids out to do stuff for the archeology span field course. We survey, we say, here's what we see, he digs it up. So it's like instant gratification. We see what we found and it's fantastic. And we see all the little artifacts that go along with it, but very infrequently when I'm doing these things for historical groups, yeah. When I worked for, worked with Andy at the, the landslide in New York, he had funding to do boreholes, so we could see some results from boreholes, but not like full dig up. Yes. Say it one more time. How have they used the findings? So the purpose of doing the survey was so that they could find where the mass burial was and put a monument up at that location. Yeah. A lot of times when, when I do these types of surveys, it's because they want to put a monument up or because they want to map out the foundation. Just last week on Friday, I had my geophysics students out. We were doing a survey of a foundation next to a church. The old church had burned down in the past and they wanted to find the foundation stones so they could lay pavers out and know where that old foundation was. Yes. Not work done that I would like to work on. Um, so the type of project that I'm thinking that I might direct my research on, I've got a sabbatical coming up. I'm very excited about that. I've been contacted numerous times by folks from the borough of Kutztown that have an interest in what's going on with the water in this area. So I'm thinking that I might diverge a little bit from geophysics, from historical stuff, and, and take a look at the hydro locally to see what's going on there. So that is probably the direction that I will be shifting. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So when I show you these images and I say, here's what I see, you're like, okay, really? Maybe. First, know where you're looking. And second, know what you expect to see. And third, look at it a really long time, a really long time. And if you stare at anything long enough, you start to see patterns in it. But the patterns have to match up with what you're looking for. And if they just don't, then you have to say they just don't. Like the first time we did the survey, I told my students, I don't see anything. There's just not anything to see there. So we can either redo it or we can set that aside and move on to another project. And it was fortunate that Heather went back to that one. Yeah, finding the patterns really is a lot of 
looking at it a long time and experience in looking at it and having seen one mass burial at the Charlestown Cemetery site when I went and did another cemetery survey where they contacted me, but they didn't tell me beforehand that there might be a mass burial here. They wanted me to find it, but they didn't want to tell me about it. I, I said, you know, this really looks like a mass burial because I'd just seen it in the work that I did two years ago with Anne. And so repetition of doing the similar types of surveys really helps with patterns as well. I worry a lot about that, but as a geophysicist, I never say this is. I always say this could be, unless I have multiple facts. I used to work for a geophysical consulting company where we would look for underground storage tanks so that drillers wouldn't puncture them and they could dig them up, clean things up. And I wrote so many reports that were so wishy-washy. The results indicate this. You should do further investigation to verify. You have to dig it up. Geophysics is just a bunch of pretty pictures unless you dig it up. Yes? Remember, uh, when you do your historical type surveys, do you ever find something that's there that you just did not expect? Like, the information you had, the, oh, this area will be blank, but there might be something over there, and then the blank area, you got your blank area. Yes, that has happened. Um, the, the one foundation image that I showed you, they didn't tell me anything about there being a wall and it actually didn't quite encompass all of the burials. So they probably had some burials going on outside of the cemetery. So yeah, that can happen that you are looking for one thing and see something else. I was not expecting to find the wall of that, that cemetery. I was not expecting to find those tree roots that were phenomenal. I love that image. Yeah. Yes. This is not the names on the monuments. This says erected by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, Patriot Order, Sons of America. And this has some of the, the people that were in there. This is not the monument at the Charlestown Cemetery or not the one that marks the mass burial. Yes. 